Today we are taking you on a historic tour of Westford and its villages. Each of the villages are unique and have their own rich history. Your tour guides are interns at the Westford Museum. I'm Sonia Chaudhry, a member of the Westford Historical Society and a student at Westford Academy. And I'm Irene Zhang, a Westford resident and a rising junior at Concord Academy. Before we begin our tour, allow me to share some of the history of our town. The first residents at the historic town of Westford were the Pawtucket, Nashua, Tadmuk, and Neshoba tribes, who were Algonquians. They primarily fished, hunted, and farmed the land. Several bodies of water and a native supply of fruits and berries were attractive to both the Native Americans and the pioneers. In 1729, a part of the West Precinct of Chemsford separated to become the town of Westford. There were less than a hundred families living there at the time. In 1730, a piece of Groton was annexed, and the boundaries of the town were set and have remained the same since that time. Imagine yourselves now living over a hundred years ago in Westford. You would find a typical New England town of farms and pastures, outlined by fieldstone walls and surrounded by deep forests. The town was made up of small villages, the center, Parker Village, Nabanasset or Brookside, Forge Village, and Graniteville. The central village, now the center, contained the meeting house, where much of the political and social business was conducted. Smaller meetings would have taken place in people's homes. The meeting house was the largest structure in the community, so it was a church as well. For over a hundred years, the church and meeting house were one. Reverend Willard Hall was the minister for almost half a century. In 1828, there was a separation of church and state, but town meetings continued to be held in the meeting house until the town hall was built. The land for the common was bought from Mr. Underwood and was used as a training field for soldiers. The common has taken many forms over the years. It was used as a training field, a hay field, the WA schoolyard, a social meeting area, and a park. As you look around the common over the years, you would have seen the meeting house, churches, three general stores, Westford Academy, a library, and several large permanent homes. The common has war memorials from the Civil War to the World Wars and the Korean War to the Vietnam War. Now let's begin the tour itself. We begin the tour at Town Hall at 55 Main Street. In 1870, Westford constructed the Town Hall. It was initially built with a Victorian-style tower, however the hurricane of 1938 toppled it down. When rebuilding the tower, it was changed to the present colonial style. The town meetings could now be held in the town hall, and not the meeting house. The social library was also placed in the town hall. The police and fire stations were added in 1974. Right next to Town Hall is the Rodenbush Community Center at 65 Main Street. This was the second Westward Academy building. It served the town from 1897 to 1955. Before 1921, it was a private high school, and in 1922, it switched to a public school. In 1955, it was renamed the William E. Rodenbush School after its principal of 25 years, and continued as a junior high school for seventh and eighth grade. Today, it serves the town as a community center, which opened back in 1976. In fact, by 1982, one out of every three families in Westford had a child within the preschool or gymnastics program of the center. Just as you corner to Main Street, you can see the Frost School at 73 Main Street. The Frost School was built back in 1908. It was a larger school compared to the district schoolhouses. At one time, Westford had 10 district schools spread throughout the villages. When Frost School opened, several of the district schools closed down. This school was named after the Westford Academy principal, William E. Frost. Mr. Frost first introduced the written examination to the school system. The school closed down in 1992 and now houses a daycare program, which is headed by the Rodenbush Community Center. On our way to the next location, think apple orchards. There were apple orchards throughout Westford. Just after the Frost School, you'll find Leland Road. At one time, Mr. Underwood's farm extended from here to the center of town. He sold a piece of his land to the town, which acted as the training field for the Westford Minuteman and militia. Next on our tour is Fairview Cemetery. 
at the corner of Main Street and Tadmuck Road. The Fairview Cemetery is Rusford's oldest and largest burial ground. The earliest grave is that of Abram Wright, dated back to 1702. In the cemetery is a table-like monument reserved for the clergy in honor of Reverend Williard Hall, who is buried here. Zacchaeus Wright, one of the founders of Westford Academy and the town's first library, is also buried here. Additionally, a casualty from the Battle of Bunker Hill during the American Revolution is buried here. Many old Westford family names, like Fletcher, Parker, Hildreth, Prescott, Kais, Spaulding, Abbott, Minot, and Whitney can be found here. Ahead on the left is the Red Farmhouse, known as the Redrew Farm, at 164 Main Street. In 1654, Estrus Reed, from Wenham, Massachusetts, was given an allotment of land, but never moved here. Instead, he kept the land for the rest of his family. A part of this house was built in 1746 by another member of the Reed family. They were farmers who became apple growers. They sold their orchard to the Drew family, who fanned the land for over 50 years before selling it. The Reeds and Drews were both apple growers and were prominent families in building the town. Look for the marker on the first house on the right of Francis Hill Road. This will be the Kais Homestead at 16 Francis Hill Road. You will find the home of Solomon Kais, who is known to be the first settler of Westford. Mr. Kais arrived here from Newbury in 1664 with a grant of land. It is believed that the road was named after his wife, Frances. The house was later owned by Solomon's descendants, such as Joseph Kais and Trustworthy Kais. From here, we will be entering Brookside Village. In Westford, at one time, there were at least seven mills from the headwaters of Stony Brook at Forge Pond to the mouth of the Merrimack River in North Chelmsford. One of the mills was a fulling and grist mill established in 1724 by William Chandler. The business of dressing cloth was here for 140 years. It became a woolen mill and one of the sites of the Abbott Wissard Mill at 12 Brookside Road. Since closing Abbott Mill, it has been used as a freezer locker by Commodore Foods and has been turned into condos. The Brookside section of town we are now entering is referred to today as Nabnasset. Nabnasset has more than seven lakes or ponds, causing many people to come to Westford to enjoy them. People came to boat, to swim, and to fish. There was a train station at Brookside, allowing easy access to the different water sources. There was also a theater located near the country club that also brought people over. Nabnasset could have once been considered a resort area of Westford. Nabonasset School at the intersection of Plain Road and Oak Hill Road will be on the right. The building was built to help relieve the congestion at the Frost School. The Nabonasset School opened on Monday, September the 18th with, with 63 pupils. This was in 1922, the date shown. It was last used as a school in 1976 when a Head Start early learning class met here. In 1983, the building was left empty. In 1984, the town turned it over to the Rodebush Community Center, which opened a daycare in the spring of 1985. As previously stated, Nemnasset has several ponds, and one of them is called Grassy Pond, also known as Grass Pond, from 1875 to 1889, and is one of the eight ponds in Westford, and is the first we will encounter on the tour. It lies just north of the intersection between Depot Road and Plain Road, the pond is a natural basin and is approximately 170 feet above sea level and has an area of 7 acres. The grassy pond is surrounded by 62.14 acres of conservation land, as well as several courses and trails, which were originally constructed by the Junior Women's Club back in 1980s. Up ahead is the Westford Depot. If you had come through this train station in the late 1800s, you would have seen a cider mill, a box factory, a sawmill, a post office, and a blacksmith shop, as well as the train depot and grist mill, all on this intersection. Today, the train tracks remain in perhaps a few grist zones from the grist mill. Prior to 1926, Westford had eight railroad stations within its border. 
From 1848 to 1926, trains traveled to the tracks picking up and delivering freight, and picking up and dropping off people as they traveled to and fro. Further down Depot Street, you will find the Abbott School at 23 Depot Street. From 1955 to 1973, this building was the Third Westford Academy. When it later became a middle school, the name changed to Abbott Middle. The weather vane on top of the middle, on top of the building, was thought to be wrought by Paul Revere. It was originally on top of the 1792 Westford Academy building. As we leave Abbott School, look to your left as we go up Depot and find the Westford Night. Did Prince Henry Sinclair really explore this area almost 100 years before Columbus? Researchers are still checking facts to see if this story is fact or fiction. History tells us that a Scotsman named Prince Henry Sinclair, the Earl of Orkney, led a 14th century exploring party to North America in 1398. After wintering in Nova Scotia, he sailed to Massachusetts. During an inland expedition to Prospect Hill in 1399 to view the countryside, one of the members of his party died. This is a memorial to said night. We will now re-enter the Westford Center. Our first stop is the J.V. Fletcher Library at 50 Main Street. In December of 1891, the house that originally stood on this site burnt down, and in 1894, construction on the library began. In 1895, J. Varnum Fletcher generously donated $10,000 towards the building of the library. On June 4, 1896, the building was dedicated and named the J. V. Fletcher Library. Right next to the library is the First Parish Church at 48 Main Street. This is also the site of the Westward Meeting House, built in 1727. The church is the third building on this site. It was built in 1794 and stood parallel to Main Street. It was used as a church and town hall until 1870. In 1868, the building was turned to face the Common and Fellowship Hall was added in 1995. Before we get to the Abbott Estate on your right is one of the three general stores, the Wright and Fletcher store at 40 Main Street. These stores stood in the center from 1839 to 1969. You could buy pickles in a barrel of brine, a coffee grinder to provide you with freshly ground coffee, or bins of spices. The country store tried to have a variety of products that would provide for the needs of the family. Today, it is the location of Muffins on Main, the Abbott Estate at 32 Main Street was built by Abiel Abbott, one of the owners of the Abbott Worcestershire Mills. Mr. Abbott would board his horse and carriage every morning and drive down Graniteville Road to his mill to work. Mr. Abbott provided jobs in his mill for many Westford residents and brought people to Westford from Europe to work at the mills. Heading down Graniteville Road, you can see the Day Homestead at 47 Graniteville Road before Cold Spring Road. The diaries of Warren and Emma Day, dating from 1868 to 1872, tell us a little about the life of people who lived during this time. Whooping feathers, cleaning lamps, tramping hay, and visiting peddlers were common activities at this time. You are now entering the village of Graniteville, which got its name because of the quarries in the village. Until 1854, Graniteville had only two or three houses. However, the coming of the railroad and the opening of the quarries allowed this part of town to grow rapidly. Granite from these quarries has been used to build the columns on Faneuil Hall, the Sumner Tunnel, and other monuments in Boston, as well as the Federal Judiciary Building in Washington, D.C. Within Graniteville, we begin at C.G. Sargent & Sons Machine Shop at 69 Broadway. In 1854, Mr. Sargent and Mr. Calvert bought a saw and grist mill. They changed the shop to make woolen and cotton machinery. One of their machines was an industrial drying machine. The drying processes used to make minute rice, granola, and M&Ms were researched right here in its labs. The Abbott Worcestershire Mill is located at the intersection of Broadway and North Main Street. In 1855, the Abbott Worcestershire Mills began in Westford. It was one of the earliest Worcestershire manufacturing mills in the United States. They made yarn for upholstery goods. 
1857, the mill was destroyed by fire and rebuilt in 1859, where it made carded yarns for carpets. On the left is Mill Pond, originally a part of Stony Brook River. It was dammed up and made into a pond to provide power to the mills. At one time, it was an apple orchard. Farther down the street, you can see the 10th District Schoolhouse at 88 North Main Street. Built in 1880, Sargent School was an earlier elementary school. When the 10th District Schoolhouse closed in 1884, students went to the Sargent School. It was named after Mr. Sargent, the owner of C.G. Sargent and Sons Machine Shop. He donated land and money to build a Methodist church behind the school as well. St. Catherine's Church, now at 107 North Main Street, was originally a wooden building across the street that was built in 1855. In 1892, Mr. Healy got a group together to get funds to build a new church. Mr. Abbott gave a lot of money to fund the building. As you pass by Town Farm Road on the left, the Town Farm, built in 1824, provided this home for people who could not provide for themselves. People would live here and help with chores and gardening until they could get back on their feet and provide for themselves. When the government provided the welfare programs, the town farm was not needed. In recent years, it was the office of the Westford Public Schools. We're now entering Forge Village. In 1710, Jonas Prescott erected forges to make iron products in this section of town. This is how this section of town got its name. The forges operated for 150 years. They made farm tools and irons, candlesticks, mortar, and pestles for the early residents of the town. There was a Forge Village nail factory on the site of Abbott Wissard Building from 1860 to 1877. As we turn left from Prescott Street to Pleasant Street, we see the area that Mr. Abbott brought for the site of his second mill in 1879. John C. Abbott is remembered in many ways as we pass through the Forge Village section of town. The brick Abbott Worsted building built in one Pleasant Street was operated as a mill from 1879 until 1956. Mr. Abbott built almost 500 homes in this section of town for his employees to use. He employed many Westward locals and hired many immigrants to keep his mills working. He provided many opportunities for his workers as well. He provided baseball, soccer, and hockey teams, even building rinks and ballparks. He created a band. He had clubhouses built at all three of his mills in town, providing fun social activities. Abbott Hall once housed six bowling alleys, pool tables, an assembly hall, and reception areas for movies and parties. There was even a clinic for the sick. Mr. Abbott was considered more of a father figure by most and less of a boss. The mill closed in 1956. Murray Printing Company took over the building in 1958 and bound books for major publishers. Today, it is an apartment complex. Across the street from the Abbott Worcester Mill building is a road that leads to Forge Pond. This pond is the headwaters for Stony Brook. From 1864 until 1931, the industry of ice harvesting was on the pond. Ice was cut and shipped as refrigeration to many areas, some as far away as the Caribbean. Today, Forge Pond is a town beach. To the right of the pond, you can see the Cameron Senior Center at 20 Pleasant Street. Named for one of the presidents of the Abbott Mills, this was once an elementary school. It is now a center for the elderly. Across the street is a home that was once a church missionary called St. Andrews, which is located at 25 Pleasant Street. Close by lies the District School No. 3 at 35 Pleasant Street. The Red Brick Schoolhouse was District School No. 3 in use from 1851 to 1871. As we head down Pleasant Street to Patent Road, you'll find the Russian Brotherhood Cemetery on the left. Many people who came to work in the mills came from different areas of Russia. They are buried here in the Russian Cemetery. The families often stay together at work and at home, socially enjoying the culture of their home country. You will see Russian names on the gravestones, except for the few names changed by marriage. The cemetery is still privately owned, so only descendants of these original people can be buried here. On the theme of cemeteries, our next site is West Lawn Cemetery, at the intersection of Country Road and Concord Road. Colonel John Robinson is buried here. 
and around the corners of Robinson School, which was renamed from Valley View to be named after Colonel Robinson, one of the leaders of the American Revolution. At 17 Robinson Road, between the Robinson and Christopher schools, there's a marker that shows where Colonel John Robinson once lived. He was a colonel during the Revolutionary War and was Westward's hero, who led 130 Westward Minutemen into battle at the North Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts. Colonel Robinson's home burned down in 1911. The boulder with the inscription was placed by the Westward Improvement Association on April 19, 1896. Opposite the Abbott Estate on Main Street is the Cameron Home at 39 Main Street. This home was lived in by Alan Cameron, one of the presidents of the Abbott Mills, and his wife, Eleanor. In 1876, their son Donald and his family used it for a private summer home until it was auctioned off in 1945. It was a Westford nursing home until 1993 and is a private home again today. Now, we'll end the tour by returning back to the Westford Museum at 2 Boston Road. This is the site of Westford's only museum. The building was originally Westward Academy. It was moved from the side of the common where the granite benches are presently located. You can learn more about Westward history and visit the Westward Museum Sundays from 1 to 3 p.m. Thank you for joining us on this tour of Westford. <laughs>